Um, I really wanted to start by saying how happy I am to be here, but it turns out I don't have the time. <laughs> um, in the solar system, Earth and Venus are sister planets. We have very similar size, internal structure, and bulk chemical composition. However, these two planets are nothing alike on the outside, and somehow they developed very dissimilar atmospheres. How did it happen? To answer this question, we really need to look into how planetary atmospheres form and evolve. Planetary atmospheres formed by volcanic decasting of volatile elements from the deep interior. One can think of a mantle as of a huge gas tank. On Venus, its gas tank is open, is wide open for CO2. And, the, and because the planet does not have plate tectonics, it's unable to put that CO2 back into the mantle. Luckily on Earth, we do have plate tectonics, which is very efficient in removing the CO2 from the atmosphere and putting it back into the mantle. It is the balance between the ingoing and the outgoing fluxes of CO2, which has been one of the major focuses of, one of the main focuses of the Deep Carbon Observatory in the past decade. What determines the, the um, potential of a mantle to keep or, or um, decast the volatiles is the stability of volatile barren minerals at extreme pressure and temperature conditions. Within the subduction plate, as it goes deeper and deeper, uh, pressure and temperature gradually build up, and volatile barren minerals turn unstable. They release the volatile elements into the mantle, which is the first step for their uh, transport back into the atmosphere. For carbon dioxide, however, such simplistic representation of a cycling is challenged by the finding of a calcite inclusion within a ultra-deep diamond transported to us all the way from the lower mantle. That finding is evidence that at least some calcite can survive subduction and penetrate into the lower mantle. Accordingly, we modeled, we, uh, we modeled the joining of calcite to the lower mantle by performing laser-heated diamond endel cell experiments. First, we squeezed teeny tiny samples, smaller than, the hair the, smaller than the thickness of a human hair between the tips of two diamond endels, and then we heated it with a laser. At a pressure of about one million atmospheres and a temperature of about 2,000 Kelvin, we observed a very, very interesting transformation. Using X-ray diffraction, we were able to fingerprint the crystal structure of this of this, minor, of this new high pressure phase against the possible crystal structures uh, that we expected at this pressure and temperature range. And the crystal structure that showed the match is very interesting because it, has, it contains carbon in a fourfold coordination, which is very unusual for low pressure carbonates. However, that's not so unusual for elemental carbon, where the graphite and diamond polymorphs of, of carbon, um, where, graphite, where elemental carbon shows an increase in, uh, in, co in carbon coordination from three to four upon the graphite to diamond transformation, which is also triggered by high pressure. Oh. Um, accordingly, one, one can think of, the, uh, of this new high pressure form of, uh, of calcite as of a diamond-like carbonate. The increase in coordination implies that there are new carbon-oxygen chemical bonds that are formed in the crystal structure. Accordingly, we use a technique called Raman spectroscopy, which is sensitive to these new chemical bonds. And here I'm showing you two Raman spectra. One was measured experimentally, and another one was predicted from, uh, from first principles. And you can, not only you can see that there is indeed this very specific signature characteristic of tetrahedrally coordinated carbon, but the overall spectra are in uh, very good agreement, which is positive evidence that indeed we have uh, tetrahedrally coordinated carbon in a very specific crystal structure. However, calcium carbonates are not unique, and magnesium and iron-bearing carbonates are also expected to undergo crossovers to diamond-like structures at pressure temperature conditions of the lower mantle. If these carbonates are indeed present there, we may expect that their physical and chemical properties are very different from their low pressure forms. Think of carbon. Its low and high pressure forms have very distinct in chemical and physical properties. Is it also the case for carbonates? While we generally don't know the physical and chemical properties of, of these diamond-like carbonates, it is reasonable to expect that because of the crystal chemical similar similarities with diamond, they may share some of its unique properties as well. Suppose that diamond-like carbonates are more chemically inert than, uh, than their low-pressure analogs. How would it affect, how would they affect the, um, the deep carbon cycle? Would they be able to provide a permanent storage for carbon dioxide in the lower mantle? Would they, would they then help us to remove CO2 from the Earth's atmosphere? These are still unopened, unanswered questions, and um, we sure hope to, uh, to answer some of these in the next decade of the Deep Carbon Observatory. Thank you.